Well, good morning. It feels kind of weird being up here. I've been gone for the last couple of weeks. I, uh, my family just got back in this last week. We got the chance to go on vacation. Um, I think maybe the, the funniest memory I have from the trip actually took place before we ever left Lubbock. Um, my son has never flown before, um, which he was thoroughly looking forward to getting a chance to fly. And we are buzzing down the tarmac there. And right as the plane gets off the ground, he's in the window seat because he's super excited. He screams. And mind you, um, it was 6.05 was our departure time to leave. And so no one is happy on this plane except Holden Haynes, all right? Um, and he screams at the top of his lungs. And I, my sister-in-law is actually having a panic attack across the aisle because she hates the takeoff and the landing of, of flying. And he screams at the top of his lungs, we're flying, you know, <laughs> so happy. Whole plane starts laughing, everybody's having a good time. And, and my sister-in-law is like, okay, everything's all right now. I can at least laugh through the panic. Uh, but that, it, was, it, was, it was a very funny moment, and it was kind of one of those things that kind of set the tone for the rest of the week. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we, we went to Disney World uh, for the first time since I was 12, um, and that's a lot of people we saw. Um, I was very anxious about all of that, but uh, it, it was a very interesting thing to watch your kids respond to all the things that they get a chance to see, uh, the smiles, uh, w which, which was a lot of fun. Um, it it kind of was interesting how it led us into, or at least me, into thinking about Father's Day today. Um, because you, you, you look at kids, and I, th I, I think you just look at kids in general, and there's this wonder, and, and there's this amazement at the little things. Um, there's this point at which I think even kids show you this. They're so excited to discuss, even just with dad or with mom or uncle or aunt or other cousin, what they're seeing, how they're seeing it. And when you tell them that things are going to be okay, when you share with them that life is going to be all right and we're making our way and God is going to take care of us and you begin to walk through hurt and pain and big questions and all these types of things, it's really, really interesting to watch how quickly a child just trusts your word just immediately trust your word. And it's almost like the older that kids get until we get to a point even when we're in our own adult lives, we stop just trusting the word of the Father and we come up with more excuses not to trust the word. Well, what about this? Well, what about this? I know, God, I mean, I hear you saying this, but what about this? And what about this and this and this and this? And the next thing you know, these worries and all of these things that come crowding in and all of these, yeah, but what about, you name it, have drowned out the amazement. They've drowned out our ability to just, not, not just accept what God has to say is true and that these promises will come to fruition, but they drowned out our ability to go, man, today was a good day. Like, this is my family it's a good day. Or this is my church family, it's a good day. I have friends who love me, it's a good day. I have other Christians who have been through the junk that I've been through, it's a good day. I also, as we get into this sermon this morning want to make sure that we also understand that our God is one who welcomes the, okay, I hear you, God, but there's this. He welcomes the conversation for that. Because I think there's some of us, for one reason or another, we don't give God all of what we're thinking, as if he doesn't already know, but we don't give that to him because it's almost like if we do, then we make it more real. Or if we bring it up in conversation, if our faith does look like it has a little bit of doubt in it, then we're not quite sure what to do with that because our faith in many ways is what we know, what we can explain, what we can share. And 
that is one of those things that hits home, and it is front and center in the text this morning. We're going to do a series this summer, and I want to look at three of the most pivotal characters in all of the Old Testament, and they set, in many cases, this phenomenal foundation for even the theology that you and I receive in the New Testament. No Old Testament character gets more play in the New Testament than Abraham, not one. And his covenant with God sets the tone, the standard, and it gives us the insight into understanding what covenant with God is going to look like for the rest of humanity. And we are living in covenant with God. It is Jesus the Christ. But in Genesis chapter 15, we see our first picture of what real covenant with God looks like, and it is monumental. It's monumental. And I know covenant's not a word that you and I use a lot. Typically, you may hear it in a wedding ceremony, and if that's your background of hearing the word covenant, that's fine. Think about it like that. We're in this together forever. I want to read for you this text coming out of, like I said, Genesis chapter 15. Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 has already been promised that he is going to have a son. He is becoming an old man. And when I say old, think like Donnie Evans type old, okay? (laughs) Okay. Just making sure you're awake. He is, he's an old guy. And he is still at this point in his journey, he is Abram. He is not Abraham. He has not entered into this new life with God completely yet. He is in the process, in the transition for him becoming who God wants him to be. We get to Genesis chapter 15 and Abraham is questioning, God, you told me I was going to get, I was going to, get to have a kid. You promised me a son. You promised me an heir. You told me these things were going to happen. And some of you know this better than I do, better than I ever will, when you long for a child. It's the only thing you can think about. And I hope that this morning, for those of you who are maybe struggling with Father's Day in one way or another, you find some peace and some hope, some sort of experience with God that transcends the words that you can put to it. I think that's what covenant with God allows us to have. And Abraham even finds a moment of healing in the moment. And so, in many ways, I pray that's your moment this morning. This is Genesis chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. After these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward will be very great. But Abram said, Lord God, what can you give me since I am childless and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Abraham continued, Look, you have given me no offspring, so a slave born in my house will be my heir. Now the word of the Lord came to him, This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, Your offspring will be that numerous. Abraham believed the, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited, credited it to him as righteousness. He also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, Lord God, how can I know that I will possess it? He said to him, bring me a three-year-old cow, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. So he brought all these things to him, cut them in half, and laid them, laid the pieces opposite each other. But he did not cut the birds in half. Birds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham, Abraham, Abram drove them away. As the sun was setting, a deep sleep came over Abram, and suddenly great terror and darkness descended upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, know this for certain, your offspring will be resident aliens for 400 years in, the land, in a land that does not belong to them and will be enslaved and oppressed there. This is the foreshadowing of Egypt and the Exodus. However, I will judge the nation they serve, and afterward they will go out with many possessions. But you will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorites has not yet fully reached its measure. When the sun had set and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the divided animals. 
On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, I give this land to your offspring from the brook of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates River, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hethites, Perizzites, Rephim, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. And yes, I practiced saying all of those words. It's interesting. I love the way this text begins because it almost seems that without fail, when God comes to us, he needs to begin the conversation with do not fear. He almost always has to start with that. And I know that that's not necessarily what we may consider as encouragement, but that is God. He comes to us and he's like, I'm going to demand something of you. I'm going to challenge you to some way. I'm going to call you to something, and it's going to get uncomfortable. But before we do that, I need you to realize when you're in conversation with me, I can be trusted. Do not fear. Don't fear. 365 times in Scripture we're told, do not fear. So every day when you wake up in the morning and your God calls out to you, maybe we should be hearing, do not fear today. You come with me. But he goes on. Because we are a people often overcome by our fear. And I know what fear does because we easily dig our heels in and then we begin to question the journey and the challenge that is laying before us because discomfort seems worse than whatever might be standing on the other side of God's calling. Because when sin walked into the world and death and pain became synonymous with life, that's almost the way that we look at things, right? We look at life now and we assume that connected to life for the rest of eternity, it feels like is death and pain. It's almost like life is not this joyous adventure with God under his great provision anymore. Now it is synonymous with pain. I mean, you hear in the background the great movie quote, life is pain. And so our God comes in and he says, no, it's not. Do not fear. I am your shield, which literally translated as I am your deliverance. I'm your deliverance from the fear. But above all, God can be trusted. Above even what we see, above our life experiences. And that's the interesting thing there, because I think for so many of us, we really, really want to trust God, but we look back on our life and we go, I know pain, I know suffering, and so because of that, it's a little bit uncomfortable just jumping when God says jump. And in the midst of this is this man who seems overwhelmed with the anxiety of having a child. Because it doesn't really matter what God promises at this point. When you're hurting, you're hurting. He's focused on being a dad and having a legacy. God's already promised to make him a great nation, to bless him, that he's going to be a blessing. And like I said, in the midst of so much hurt, sometimes we look around and we're like, God, I understand your promises. I understand the possibilities of life with you, but they just don't cut it when I'm feeling like this. So God steps up with this phenomenal metaphorical response and showing him the sky and tells him that his descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. That he's not even going to be able to count the number of heirs in his lineage. I'm not sure how many stars Abraham could see, but scientifically we now know that there are over 73 sextillion stars in what is available for us to to view. When God makes a promise, it's kind of a go big or go home type of deal, you know? Like, watch what I can do. Because you think this situation is hopeless, and I'm going to show you something beyond your imagination. And interestingly enough, Abraham doesn't respond the way that I typically would. Because I'm sure I would have responded to God with some sort of line, something along the lines of saying, okay, thanks God, but how can I know that you're really going to fulfill all of this? I mean, that was a pretty awesome starry picture you just gave me, but uh, what's the concrete thing for me to settle on? I want something that I can take with me. But Abraham doesn't do that 
Immediately, the scriptures tell us that Abraham believed the Lord. And what's really, really interesting is there's a word missing there based upon the connotation and the translation that we should have when we read this Hebrew phrase here. It shouldn't say Abraham believed the Lord. It ought to literally say Abraham believed in the Lord. And he, God, credited it to him as righteousness. And that's a great line. Abraham was made right with God because he believed in God. This commitment brings back all of these conversations that you see even with Jesus when he looks at certain people and he says, woman, your faith has healed you. Woman or child or man or whoever it is, your faith has saved you. You've been healed because of this. And I know this is a difficult conversation for many of us because we're trying to figure out how does my faith become a participating factor in God's ability to bring healing into my life, and yet that's exactly what's taking place here, and we do see this even throughout the rest of Scripture, that our faith actually does play an enormous part in our ability to be healed. That somehow risking everything upon God brings us healing in the moment and brings us into a new intimacy with God. Abraham risks, and he's rewarded for it. He puts his greatest hurt, his greatest uncertainty in the hands of God, and he finds peace and intimacy. He has a faith breakthrough. Now, it's this, at this point in the conversation, I think we might need to step back and wrestle with what actually is faith. Because we're trying to figure out, how does my faith play a role in this? What, what does that look like? How is it that my faith moves me to a point where I can experience real healing? Because the only requirement to get right with God, in all honesty, is to trust God. That's the issue going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. God calls them to a certain way of living. They trust their own perspective on life more than they trust him, and they find themselves in ruin. We teach this stuff, though, week in and week out, that you don't have to do anything, and yet you hear the words of James echoing in the back of our heads that faith without works is dead. So doing something does matter. James tells us specifically about Abraham that it's Abraham's faith that was made complete when he offered to sacrifice his son Isaac. And we're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. But I think this is where we get mixed up in this tension of trying to figure out what exactly is faith. And we get a little bit off track because faith is not about believing the right things. It's not. It's not about knowing all of the right answers and having come to all of the right conclusions on all of the world's major topics and big issues. That's the point of James's letter, that he reminds us that we can know everything, but if we don't do something and live according to God's ways, then that faith is dead. And yet, on the other hand, if you paint the tension correctly, far too many people have come to believe that if we do it all right, church-going, baptism, communion, tithing, all of these things that we talk about on a regular basis, then we are made right with God, or we are living right with God. And the Apostle Paul shows us in Galatians, that's not really what makes you right with God either. Because Abraham, in Paul's words, he was made right with God before he did anything. And this is what's really, really difficult for the Christian world right now because we're trying to figure out when we look at the immorality of what takes place in our culture today and we look at all of the things that people struggle with and yet you take a stance where you join a church and you're like, yes, I'm going to dedicate myself to a church community and you begin to wrestle with the fact that I'm not sure we all believe the same things and I'm pretty certain that this is a big one to me and they don't seem to think it's a big one. And so you have this constant tension between what we do and what we believe. And yet in Moses, I'm sorry, in Abraham's journey here and what he's painting for us and what we see from James and when we pair this with what we see with Paul, neither one of those views is really what defines faith. 
Faith is not about what you know, and it's not about what you do. It's about who you're in relationship with. It's not about having great faith. It's about believing in a great God. Abraham wasn't made righteous before God because he believed what God was telling him. Abraham was made righteous. Abraham found peace, and Abraham had a breakthrough in his faith because he believed in the one who was giving the promise. This is the conversation about surrender and trust. It's not one about control or placing faith in what you know, because if it's about placing faith in what you know or what you do, you're the center of your faith, and that's not faith. That's why this next scene is so very, very important. It's kind of weird, it's pretty intense. For those of us in our culture today, it's a little bit distant, like what is actually happening here. But it shows the heart of God and it alludes to the future event that will change the world. See, when two parties would come together, and many of you know this, but when two parties would come together, especially in this situation to make a covenant, what they would do, particularly Abraham's job here, it was he would dig a trench, they would cut these animals in half put them on the outsides of this trench, and the blood would flow down into the trench and pool up down there. Then both parties would get at the very front of the trench, and they would walk through the blood. And as they walk through the blood, I know this is a little bit weird. Some of you are like, what is actually happening? I know it's weird. I don't know what to tell you, okay? This is what's happening. But as both parties would walk through the blood, the oath that they were making to one another was that If I don't uphold my side of this covenant, if I don't follow through on this commitment, then what has happened to these animals, may that happen to me. This is probably the first place we started hearing about blood oaths, okay? And so what happens next is unheard of. God causes Abraham to fall into a deep sleep, And God, in the form of a smoking fire pot and a fiery torch, passes through the blood alone. Abraham is not asked to participate in making the covenant. He is simply called to receive it as a gift. He is simply gifted with this divine covenant from God, one that proclaims loud and clear that God can be trusted and God will carry the brunt of the oath. God so desires relationship with Abraham and all of the offspring that Abraham will have that he would promise to uphold both sides of this covenant. And as Christians, this is the exact connection we make to Jesus Christ. That here is the Christ, our new covenant, and the, the new covenant for all of mankind upholding both sides. That it's not about what you know, and it's not about what you do, it's about who you're in relationship with. It's the reason why Jesus can make the claim, I am the only way to the Father. Jesus has to uphold both sides of the covenant just like God has to uphold both sides of the covenant for Abraham because you and I cannot promise our undivided loyalty to God because we are unable to perfectly follow through. We just can't. And so God, both here and with Jesus, shows us that he will do it for us, that this is the only place to put your faith. As we mature, though, I think we have to wrestle with some big questions. It's interesting how fear walks into our world and we begin to hear the do not fear moment there at the beginning again because we don't really want to have to wrestle with some difficult things because it's almost like we know there's this monster 
sitting out there. But if we talk about that monster, that monster actually becomes real and has a hold upon my life. And what's really, really interesting is, is that that monster of fear that's hanging out that we refuse to deal with and refuse to talk about is actually enslaving our life. And when we finally have the words to put to it and talk about the situation, that monster loses a ton of power. And so I have to ask you, do you know God? Not do you know about God. Not do you do things for God. Do you know God? Do you speak with God? Does he speak with you? Does your relationship with God set the foundation for your life? Do you know how to open up your relationship with God so that your kids can see it? Because here's the question that, you gotta have, that you're going to have to wrestle with and I'm going to have to wrestle with. If the answer is no to those questions, we have got to seek some help. Because I promise you this, it won't come from within inside you. There are a few things I have learned about brokenness in my life. I can't heal myself. I just can't. I have to have help. And as faith full people will we receive help will we ask for help because this is what typically happens for me on this side of it being a minister people don't ask for help till they're in crisis and then we want a real cheap escape plan out of that crisis that comes immediately that's not really how it works also the reason why God has to prove himself in this moment because he's spoken about all of his promises and now he proves to Abraham just like the cross and the resurrection and the ascension and Pentecost prove to us our God can be trusted and he will carry us through regardless of where our faith wavers because Abraham's faith wavers just a couple of chapters after this And so God has to be the one to empower and to lead. And the beauty of the thing is, the beauty of the whole conversation for you and I in the midst of this kind of, come towards, kind of comes towards the end. And here's what I want to say to that, is it's not just the promise of what is to come. Notice, did you hear the conversation about death? Did you hear it? That Abraham would die in peace. Those are the words of God. Think about everything that has happened in the last 15 chapters of Genesis where we have perfect creation and we end up in Genesis chapter 3 and death destroys everything. It is the unbeatable thing that sits there in the midst of every single life. And for the first time in all of Scripture, it is God speaking when he steps up and he says, you're going to die in peace God says you will die in peace. What has happened now based upon covenant with God? He can be trusted completely. He is faith. But it's not about what you know. And it's not about what you do. It's about who you're in relationship with. That's why Paul can make the statement, these three remain faith, hope, and love. And oh, by the way, now that you live in covenant with God, death is a peaceful transition into eternity with me. In covenant with God, death loses all power and is swallowed up by the great shalom that we see throughout all of the Old Testament with Abraham, Moses, Elijah, and all the rest. And death becomes a peaceful transition into eternity with God. Maybe the greatest thing sitting as an obstacle to you and I for faith goes all the way back to the very first verse, do not fear. Do not fear. But make no mistake, when God comes calling with the do not fear, he almost always follows it up with something along the lines of, Come with me. 
because I'm going to take you on a journey. And this journey, is go- this journey is going to be difficult, but it is going to bring you healing. And I promise you, if you are in covenant with me, I will carry you through. And even when you die, you're going to die in peace. I felt like the only way to end this sermon this morning was with a little bit of worship. And so I'm going to ask the band to come back up here, and we're going to have one more song. This is the point at which, in your sermon, at least for me, maybe throughout the last little bit, where I just keep thinking to myself over and over and over, I'm like, okay, God, I need you to do something big here, and I don't care if you use me or not. Because I know that there are many of us in this room who are ravaged by fear. I know that there are many of us in this room who are terrified to ask for help. I know that there are several of us in this room who are afraid of death, wrestling with death, and we're pretty sure death seems bigger than God right now. And it's at this point that I I think only worship gets us there. That we speak some things we may not believe. We hear from others as they speak and sing some things we may not be sure we can believe. And God moves in a spirit-driven way to bring what Abraham gets here. Immediate healing. Immediate help. Not that all of life's problems are gone, but that God can be trusted. That in this moment, you can put your faith in this God that you know who's making himself available to you. And this can be one of those moments for your life. And you find righteousness being gifted down from on high. Let's stand and we'll have our last song.